Hey, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. I'm Xavier from France. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. And uh, so, yeah, you just uh, stole uh, my introduction. I was about to ask you to raise your hands. So I know that half of the people here know GraphQL. Uh, for the people who know GraphQL, who uses GraphQL daily, please? Could you raise again your hand? Yeah, OK, a few people. Cool. I hope by the end of the talk, more people will be able to raise their hand like this. And uh, on the people who are just new to GraphQL, who has actually tried it? Like, who's, please raise your hand again. Like, who has tried it? Do something? Just a side project? Cool. So we have different levels. This talk is an introduction to GraphQL. And for people who are really knowledgeable about GraphQL, I hope you can take this talk as a way to explain your mates, your colleagues, how to, hey, Hey, look at GraphQL. It's awesome. Like, uh, and for those who are new, I hope it will help you get stuck on it and uh, get, get started as soon as possible. So uh, just a word of introduction. Uh, I've been using GraphQL for about one year. And uh, it started like, oh, looks nice. And then hacking something. And then contributing to an open source project and migrating from uh, an old stack to a GraphQL data layer and then contributing back to major uh, JavaScript libraries using GraphQL. I believe that GraphQL is here to stick, and uh, it's uh, really something that helps our flow or how we build uh, applications. So I've been using this keyword, GraphQL, GraphQL. We are at GraphQL Meetup. This talk is about how to get, why you should care. And uh, we'll see what is GraphQL, comparing with a traditional approach to fetch data in a modern web app, how to create a GraphQL API, how to consume this GraphQL API, and then, well, how to integrate it in our apps. Like, I believe we are developers, we are building web apps, so how to get started uh, efficiently. Just a um, disclosure, I'm stocked on GraphQL. I use it daily, I love it. So I took a grow uh, uh, where we, we are consistency, where we build web apps for clients, we also do trainings, and uh, yeah, it's redundant, but uh, GraphQL is awesome. So let's get started. GraphQL is about APIs. GraphQL is a query language. It's just a new way to ask for data in your applications. To understand what, so we speak about API, to understand how it works, we'll start with, a, with an overview from uh, the Star Wars heroes. So I don't know if you, uh, so I believe you, you're familiar with Star Wars. If you are not, please ask your, your neighbor to give you a quick introduction about uh, Star Wars. And um, we'll see, We'll see how we can ask data. Let's imagine we have an application. We are all building a new application about Star Wars. And we want data about a specific movie, the fifth episode. And we want data about Luke, his friends, and the starships. So how would we do with REST? Well, with REST, we would have several endpoints. And uh, we have this screen where we want to know about Luke, his friends, and the starships. So, we make a request. We make a request to Luke ID, and we get data about Luke. And um, OK, so far, so good. And we get some, some other endpoints or IDs. So I can ask for friends. And I, I see four IDs. And with these four IDs, I get four friends. So I get Han Solo, Leia, C3PO, and R2. And um, then I realize, oh, yeah, I also have data about the starships looks, looks uh, as piloted in this movie. So I can make two requests again. And I know that he has driven a, a piloted X-Wing and an Imperial Shuttle. OK. And then I realize that, oh, Han Solo also has endpoints data. I can query them. So two queries later, I fetch the same, the same endpoint. I get some kind of same data. And I also know that he piloted the infamous Millennium Falcon. So what just happened here is like, with nine API calls, nine HTTP requests, I've mapped something that looks kind of a data model, right? We have different kind of entities, heroes, starships. And if we, for instance, start from the rocket on top, on the top left, we could have asked the same data coming from any other endpoint with a certain amount of requests, we could have achieved the same thing. And this is, this is our data model. This is kind of a graph. And to, do, to achieve that, we made more, many calls, many HTTP requests. And remember, that looks somehow like a graph. So how would we do with GraphQL? 
Well, I believe that, um, I, what's the expression in English? Uh, a picture is worse than 1,000 words. So, it's actually some words. This is GraphQL. This tool is called Graphical, and um, it's a graphical tool. And um, so here you can see the syntax of a query where I'm asking for a hero on a specific film. Uh, I want, I want uh, his name, starships, friend, name, starships. I, kind of the things I wanted for, for the screen, right? There's this little play button that I can press, run a query, and here. Here I got my data. You can see that kind of maps like this JSON, JSON structure, my map like um, what's on the left side. And at some point I'm like, mm, I actually don't care about the starships. So I can remove it, run my query again, and here I am, same kind of, same kind of data. I actually don't care about the friend starship. Beware that it's, oh, again, just one query. I'm just making one query to get the data that I want. And maybe I'm like, oh yeah, actually like my product manager t comes to me and tells me, oh yeah, we need to know in which film, in which movies does the hero appear. So I'm here and um, I'm toggling my autocomplete up and uh, I customize my request on the fly. Do you imagine doing that with REST endpoints? Well, no, you, well, you can imagine, but you don't do it in real life. And uh, we, can, we are able to do that thanks to graphic, GraphQL and uh, if I may want to discover a new field or stuff, I have my, my, my documentation just in line with this tool. So this is high level overview of how you would ask from the client to a server, send a GraphQL query. Let's understand how it works. So yeah, to wrap up, one query to get all the data that I want. Query language, GraphQL. It's a query language. It could have been, it could have been called a tree QL, but that's, that's less fancy. So we call it GraphQL. It's actually, fundamentally, it gets a piece of your graph data model, like how, how is your data, and take it back as a tree that you can use in your UI. And how are you able to do that? It's thanks to the API contract. This API contract is called the schema, and it is the source of truth of how you will ask data in your application. If we have a look at what the schema looks like, it's somehow, uh, well, this is called the schema definition language. Uh, Pierre has uh, some, uh, some neat, uh, neat information about that you, you will see later. And this is how you would say, hey, hey server, this is a server, these are my capabilities. Your client can ask for that or that, and if you ask something that you are not allowed, I won't give it to you. And how, how do I know that you're allowed or not? It's thanks to the types, the type system. GraphQL is strongly typed, and so you can see that a hero uh, accept a parameter of episode and return a character, or um, a character is made of several types, and um, you may see this mutation thing here. I don't know if it's the best parallel, but uh, if you think about the CRUD system, create, read, update, delete, read would be the query, and create, update, delete would be the mutations. You get some data, you read them, or you operate on this data. So, so far, okay, I can describe how I want data, but what's the real meat behind that? Well, this is called resolvers. It's like, take your schema and map it with a function to data. And this data can live anywhere. This can be your SQL backend, no SQL backend, some REST endpoints living somewhere, a microservice that you depend on, from another company or whatever, name it. And this reads all the functions that, like, I have my schema, I describe, hey, this is like this, and maps to some functions. And these functions are basic functions, actually. Just like, uh, hey, um, I want some uh, from this collection, I want this arrow based on this parameter, or, and maybe from, so here what we can see is that from the hero, we, uh, we are from a character, we want starships. And it's like you can define the dependencies that you have between types or things like this. And it, they are just basic functions. This is the keyword here to remember, basic functions. And if we take these basic functions that maps to our schema, we actually have a GraphQL server. And what is a GraphQL server? 
just type definitions bound to these basic functions, and uh, you bound them to an endpoint, one endpoint. And why can you do, when can you have one endpoint and not n endpoints? Because of the type system. The type system declaring your capabilities can analyze the queries that you will send to it and make it way through it to give you back some the data that you want. So, here are a list of bullet points that uh, you may consider. You can actually go to graphql.org, you will have the same thing with nice graphics to explain you. This has all the benefits at a high level view of what GraphQL provides you. All set? Let's consume the API now. This is the query that we will send. We are on the fifth episode, the Empire one. Lucas still two hands. I don't know if you remember, but he lose one hand at some point. It's pretty important for the purpose of the talk. And um, this is a query I want to, to send from, uh, let's say I have a React Native app. It could be an iOS app or a React app, whatever, or JavaScript app. I'm more familiar with JavaScript, so we will stay in the context of JavaScript. And I want to send this query to my backend. Well, I can do it with a simple function, and everything is fine. I just send a query, wait for the result, pass it, and well, I'm good to go. But nowadays, we, we, build, we build complex applications, right? And complex applications, like modern applications, this solution, uh, yeah, that wouldn't fit. This is why I would like you to discover GraphQL clients. GraphQL clients is how you front end will be uh, front end folks will be able to consume the awesome things that the back end folks have made, and um, and yeah, this is these are great tools. So disclosure again, I will I will speak about the Apollo client, which is the one I'm more familiar with. Relay, the Relay client, uh, which is made for React by, by Facebook, for Facebook. It's a nice architecture too. I believe folks at Shopify, you have your own solution for that. And uh, well, everyone picks the tools that fit your needs, really. And um, most of the popular GraphQL clients share the same uh, benefits for us developers. So first benefit would be caching. Let's um, Let's get back into the context of our Star Wars application. I make a request. I make my request to get information about Luke, his friends, starships, and I, I switch to another screen. Let's say the galaxy. And when I come back to my Luke, uh, Luke screen, I actually don't want to fetch data again. Like I don't want to make a, a new request. I expect that my GraphQL client kept the data, and uh, I have it. I, uh, I can have it out of the box. Then. Consistency. Remember, look. Remember two hands. Like, imagine that your application is is live connected to um, to the movies that you are watching, and you you see Luke on one side and he's appearing on other pieces of the of your UI. And whenever a change is made, you want this this change to be reflected everywhere. It's like you want to provide your users the best exper user experience possible, right? So, inconsistency in data. Yeah. That's not something that you want. So GraphQL client, thanks to cache normalization, can, uh, can achieve that. Responsiveness. So, well, to get out of the example, I believe most of us use Facebook, Twitter, GraphQL, uh, sorry, GitHub. And uh, by the way, these services use GraphQL, so you consume GraphQL by these services. And so when you when you comment on a post, when you like, when you favorite a tweet, when you answer to an issue, well, you, you get, this, this appears right away on your screen, right? But on the server, it may, may have failed, or it may retry later, or it may do the job and actually save 10 seconds later. But on the client, it was right away. This is responsiveness. GraphQL clients allows you to have optimistic UIs and patterns like this in a really easy way. And this is where it will integrate with your, uh, the view layers that you use. So Relay is made for React. Apollo as the Apollo client can uh, have integrations with React, Angular, Vue, Ember, um, and you have a really nice uh, vanilla JavaScript implementation, so you can hack it to do whatever you want. And uh, yeah, it's actually so 
If you do React, you may be familiar with uh, higher order components. The API of the higher order components provided by React Apollo is really slick, and uh, it's, a it's really painless. So if we, if we go over what we have seen, these four benefits, there is actually another one. It's a hidden one. It's my favorite one. And uh, well, let me show you. So this presentation is actually built with, uh, with React and Apollo. And uh, I, have a, I have here a Chrome DevTools extension to inspect uh, my, my, my GraphQL client. I have a graphical embed here. And um, I can actually, oh yeah, they added mutations. I wasn't aware of that. But I have access to my store. Actually, don't have access to my store, but um, I, I can. Uh, I should have made the update. I think Dart thing might be broken. The? I think the Dart thing. Okay, so the the Dart theme is broken, unfortunately. But maybe quickly. Yeah, bad idea, right? Live coding stuff. Light up. Tech tech. Yeah. Well, yeah. So this was about developer effectiveness. So I've run something. Yeah, we got it. So this was blinking. The, the effect disappeared. But the point here is it's painless to, to add any functionalities that you want. So for instance, uh, I'm, I'm using here a custom way to present my slides with React. And I've embedded my, um, I've made my custom higher order components on top of this higher order component that I provide to be to have an, a painless flow to fetch some new data and make it show, change slides, developer effectiveness. We are here to answer, okay, we need, we have these requirements, we need to answer the, the needs of our clients, of our, of our users, but the tooling that we have nowadays empowers us. How about Webpack? Remember Webpack 1, Webpack 2, how it's easier now? Every tooling is now easier for us to build awesome stuff. And so, yeah, um, graphical clients for the win. And um, yeah, it's so we see how to create an API, consume an API, but we are not alone, and many people are doing the same. And the ecosystem is really great. Both on the side of the community and uh, the tools that are, that are around, uh, the business that's, that are created on top of GraphQL. And uh, so I'm mainly a JavaScript developer, but uh, the Ruby ecosystem, Scala, uh, Elm, even, which is great. Uh, Reason, maybe. But so we have a, the, the, community, the world community is stocked around this, um, this specification, this language, and uh, this is awesome. So, for those of you who don't use, who don't use GraphQL, but if I succeed to sparkle a desire, about, to spark a desire to use it, well, this is how you will sell it to your boss. Easier developer life. What does mean easier developer life? It means cost reduction. It means that you go faster. It means that you create sustainable products, strong, uh, robust products. And with GraphQL, I can, I can create, so from any kind of front end or devices, uh, desktop, mobile, a fridge, satellite, whatever. And I, I can ask, any kind of backend. I, I actually do not care where the data comes from. I just want data and I get it easy. And so my favorite part is that I can mock it. I can mock the data. So I, I wasn't into testing until recently. Well, we all learn uh, new stuff every day. And um, I discovered how you mock data. And this is just amazing. Let's, let's face your, so I'm a front-end developer. And I'm with, uh, with my colleague who is more a back-end developer, and we, we, are with, we are with the product manager, and we're like, okay, yeah, we need to design this new feature. So we, we are on the whiteboard starting to make circles, blah, 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 and we agreed on the API. We agreed, okay, this new feature has this kind of type, this kind of fields, this should be that. And, well, we can just specify, okay, a profile, so a name, a picture. This will be the fake data. And as a front-end developer, I can right away start to consume this fake data with the mocking tools that I have uh, that are accessible and make the real queries that will then send to a fake server and the backend folks can start to design, okay, yeah, we will store it there or we will build these data sources to get this data. No more waterfall process, 
parallelization. And last but not least, because you may you, you start to be okay, that's cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, but my application. How do I integrate it in my application? GraphQL is incrementally adoptable. That means that this new feature, even if you use a completely different stack, you can start to build this little feature with that. Just leave aside. And uh, slowly but surely, make it grow if you like it. And uh, you may have plenty of rest endpoints. Well, you can drop them, in, drop them in your GraphQL server, no problem. And at some point, change the way you ask for the data. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, adding GraphQL to your existing ac application, I believe uh, it's a piece of cake. This is a takeaway for you. Uh, so this slide are available at graphql.now.sh. And uh, you may see this query that you can run on this server, which is, uh, so it's called Launchpad. It's, uh, if you want to try GraphQL quickly, uh, it's um, yeah, great tools, and uh, which got open source like a few days ago, by the way. And uh, yeah, you can run this query to get a recap of everything that I said during this talk. And especially how to get started. Uh, I believe graphql.com now is, uh, is online, which is a great way also to, to get there. But so graphql.com, graphql.org, learnapollo.com if you are more uh, front-end person, and launchpad.graphql.com if you are more back-end person. Uh, last but not least, I wouldn't be there without these folks who got inspired me, uh, who, got, who got me inspired to, to get started on GraphQL. So if you're interested in GraphQL, follow them on Twitter to do, to do neat stuff. And uh, yeah, that's all. I'm Xavier, Xav underscore CZ on Twitter. Hope you have a good one. Happy hacking. Hi, I'm Pierre. Uh, I work for Meteor. Meteor does a lot of GraphQL nowadays. So we write the Apollo clients for web, iOS, Android. We have the Apollo developer tools we saw fail a few minutes ago. Um, GraphQL tools on GraphQL server are node packages to do server development in JavaScript. Uh, some of the tools can be used on the client as well. Um, Launchpads that we haven't seen, I think, so far is a um, kind of a JS Fiddle style website. You go there, you write some codes on the left for your server. You have this graphical interface to run queries on the right. And as you edit codes, the server is automatically reloaded. It's exposed over the internet, so it's a very simple way to put a, a graphical server together really quickly without running anything on your laptop. Um, and Optics is the performance monitoring insights tool for GraphQL servers. Um, so in the current model, you run an agent in your GraphQL server that reports to our service and you get this UI I can show later that gives you tons of stats about how things are performing and um, soon um, a few more things about errors and such. Um, and we do a bunch of, we write a bunch of articles. Uh, we do a bunch of talks, hopefully better than this one. Um, I'm not usually doing this. We're hiring uh, and we are hiring in Toronto. So done. So yeah, um, my background is maybe not traditional for somebody working with GraphQL nowadays. Um, I mostly worked in platform and infrastructure in the past. Um, I've done some product development, but usually for internal tools and such, um, and usually geared towards engineers. Um, during this talk, I, I'm not really talking as Apollo slash Meteor. A lot of what I'm gonna be saying is my personal opinion, my point of view, and we don't necessarily all agree on what I'm gonna be saying. Nobody verified that it was fine for me to say those things. I am saying them as myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, I discovered GraphQL basically when I joined Meteor. Uh, we discussed it during the interview process. It took me a really long time to fully understand GraphQL. I think things have improved a lot by now. Um, online resources are much, much better. But definitely back a year ago, um, it was hard to distinguish what's GraphQL JS, which already seems to copy, versus what's GraphQL the language. The spec is a bit weird, but I'll get back to that shortly. Um, I've been building uh, optics, mm, all of the infrastructure, a bunch of the instrumentation, um, so GraphQL tooling. Uh, optics uses GraphQL itself, so I use GraphQL, I work on GraphQL tooling, I do a lot of GraphQL. And it's fair to say that I would not have, like my internal model for GraphQL 
was different back in February of this year. Like it took me a really, really long time to fully grasp it. Um, I, that shouldn't be too scary. It's pretty easy to get started. It's pretty easy to use, but it is a different paradigm. It, it is quite powerful. And so expect a, sort of a journey um, from initially playing with it to feeling fully comfortable maintaining schemas and um, potentially debugging implementations if you run into issues with your server library, stuff like that. Like it's, um, it's, it's a complex, complex spec. And it is a spec. So this is the table of contents for the spec. Um, I would argue that the section six that explains how a query should be executed shouldn't really be in the spec. Um, GraphQL is a spec for a language between your client and your server. Section six is entirely about how about a programming model for servers, a way you can write your custom server for your custom schema and types and everything on top of a GraphQL server library. It happens to be how most GraphQL server libraries work today, but it's not a requirement. So to fully understand GraphQL, especially if you're gonna be doing front-end work, I would basically try to ignore section six altogether and imagine it's literally not there in the first place. Um, so it's a query language, as we mentioned earlier, it's a type system. Uh, it offers introspection, and the rest is essentially how to execute and how to respond. The details are a bit boring. You might get confused by some of the terminology in the ecosystem. Um, people tend to use the word query to mean many different things. So I'm gonna clarify right away. You send a request, you get a response back. In your request, you have a query document, you have optionally an operation name because a query document can contain multiple operations. And so you can basically send all of them and specify which one you want. Um, and you can pass variables for your operation. Where it gets really confusing is that operations have a type. You can, as you saw earlier, send a query or send a mutation. A query operation is not the same thing as a query document. And that makes conversation sometimes pretty difficult. So yeah, the query language, you might have um, glanced at it shortly earlier. You describe what you want, you get something back with the exact same shape. You can ask for exactly what you want as long as the schema offers it. GraphQL does not care about transport. Uh, very commonly, people use uh, JSON post, JSON responses over HTTP. You could implement it over SN1 over email and it would still be GraphQL. Um, it doesn't really care about encoding either. There is a lot of rules about how you should use it if you use JSON and how you should do JSON, but you don't have to. And typically, I would, if you start thinking about using GraphQL and you have concerns about how things would perform, how inefficient the encoding is, I would basically ignore that because GraphQL does not care about encoding. You could, you could use GraphQL and change the encoding to meet your needs. If you want to use Seabor, message pack, somehow hack something on top of what above, you can. You don't have to use JSON. And another, very commonly a question is, but so how, how slow is it? How expensive is it? That depends on your implementation. But from a purely theoretical standpoint, none of what a server has to do really bears any cost at runtime. Um, you have to parse the query, but that can be cached very easily. You can even whitelist your query. So you can say, my server in production will not accept arbitrary queries. If you go talk to my server in production, and you ask me for my, your friends, 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 because, I've never, because nobody whitelisted that query, the server will just not accept to run this, right? It will just reject the query. So there's parsing, there's this validation phase, same thing, it can, it can be cached um, pretty trivially. And the execution nowadays, so arguably every server implementation nowadays is a clone of the reference implementation that is pretty naive. Um, and in theory, it could, be made it could be made much, much faster. So I would not worry about the performance today necessarily unless you measure that it's bad, in which case come talk to us and we can probably do something about it. Um, the overhead of GraphQL is probably not the bottleneck. So you ask what you want as a client, you get what's, what you asked for back, that's great. To me as a, as a mostly backend developer, the amazing thing is the schema. It's the fact that and like a SQL schema that basically describes how the data is shaped in my database. The GraphQL schema is both the model, data model, 
what the data looks like, but also how I can query it, because it's, those are one and the same in GraphQL. Yeah, you start from somewhere in your graph, and you basically describe how you want to traverse the graph. And when you traverse the graph, you basically access fields, and maybe those fields take parameters, and you know which parameters are re optional or required, what their names are, what their types are, what you're going to get back, and that's how you get this graphical experience you saw earlier where you get autocomplete. If you write a query and something is wrong in your query, it can tell you right away, even before sending it to the server, because the way a query is validated is part of the spec, and the same code can run on your client on your server. Um, and yes, so that schema tells you what you can query from the endpoint. Part of the schema is the introspection schema. So every single GraphQL server that's compliant with the spec exposes a field underscore underscore schema, and in there you have all of the information you need about the schema. And so when you saw GraphQL earlier, offering you to complete, um, nothing was done to configure GraphQL. The only thing you have to give GraphQL is the endpoint to talk to. And on startup, it sends an introspection query to get all of the information about all of your types to get your schema back, and that's, that's what it works with, right? And all of the tooling, similarly, can, can be built that way. That being said, I do recommend in your workflow to see, to see this, this schema definition as, as a living document, uh, as something that both front-end and back-end developers know about, know where to find, know how to edit, know how to discuss. Um, it is essentially your contract between client and server. It is, well, next slide, I guess. <laughs> and one great workflow we found uh, when we built, well, first some of the features in our Galaxy product and then when we built Optics, was that if we started with a schema and we started by discussing the schema, we ended up with a much better data modeling than we would focusing on the backend aspects because we instantly had the front-end concerns in mind and we were thinking more about the data in terms of how it's accessed rather than stored. Uh, a very common mistake when doing data modeling is to focus on the storage as opposed to the access patterns. That's what truly really matters for performance in particular. Um, and so the workflow we have now is if, I, if we want to build a new feature, we modify this schema file that's in the repository, we commit that, and we push it. We open a PR, the PR fails, because every, every PR in CI, we regenerate the schema file from the server where the, ser where the server implementation lives, right? And so at CI time, we basically query the introspection, write that back to this file, and if the file changed from Git, we say, oh, you haven't checked in a change to your schema, right? Very low overhead tooling. <laughs> it, does a, it, it runs a script to dump the schema in a file, runs git diff, if that returns non-zero, um, you know the schema changed underneath your feet. Very simple. And working that way, the front-end team can go ahead, implement mocking, and start building the front-end, whilst the back-end team can essentially focus on making CI go green. Um, we build Optics front-end, back-end, and the agents entirely in parallel over a period of about two months. On the agent side, we used Protobuf. Um, on the uh, UI side, we used GraphQL. And once all of the bases came together, when, the first time we could have them talk to each other, a few things were broken, but two days later, everything was EA ready. And that was kind of mind-blowing to me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so stage your change, ship it, and move on to the next feature. Um, schema first has uh, completely changed my dev workflow, and I think for the better. That does sound great. That being said, I want to point out um, that whilst you might often hear the argument that, oh, with GraphQL, you don't have to version your endpoints anymore, you don't have to have 50 endpoints for every single um, iOS version and Android version, and et cetera, you can't really just make changes to your schemas, right? You, you have all clients, they rely on the, schema, on the old schema, and so in practice, very, very few changes can be made to your schema that, are, that maintain backwards compatibility. Having worked on optics, I would recommend, given we have nice stats about your different types and how they're consumed, to um, have your service report into optics. And so before you make a change, like renaming a field, removing a field, adding, etc., making any change that might break compatibility, check whether it's still used or not, and if so, by whom, and 
Hopefully, Optics does that well for you. Um, so yes, as I mentioned earlier, if you have an endpoint, you have the schema. If you have a query and, a, and the schema, you know exactly what the shape of the response would be. And knowing what the shape of the response is going to be, you can, you can generate for a given GraphQL query types in Swift or Java or Kotlin or um, TypeScript or whatever it is you want to use um, so that having received the response back from your server, you can start traversing it as an object graph with proper type information, right? Because all of that can be derived from the schema and from the query itself. And that's great. Uh, that's definitely great for clients. It's, it's not necessarily widely available and integrated with your ID of choice, but your help is more than welcome to make that better. Um, I'm slightly less clear as to whether code generation is the right approach for servers. We're exploring a bunch of different approaches for servers at NDG right now. Um, but that's certainly an option that we're looking into. And yes, so use a GraphQL library. I, I, I don't care if you use ours or not. <laughs> but the problems it solves for you, like sure, you can, you can basically do a curl, pass your GraphQL query in some JSON body, get back some JSON back. Like, you don't need a GraphQL library to query a GraphQL server. That's not necessary. GraphQL is really easy to use without a library. You're just going to run into problems you don't want to solve yourself. You don't want to figure out when to refetch, how to cache, what's object identity, um, how to propagate your, your changes through your, through your uh, view layer efficiently. You, know, you, like, you do not want to deal with these issues. Um, a lot of bugs have been found and fixed in Apollo Client. There's probably a lot left, but the point is you don't want to go through that same process yourself. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm gonna go very quickly through a few things that people tend to ask about when they start using GraphQL. One of them is authentication, how to do it. Um, my answer would be the same way you would any other endpoint, whether it's an API, whether it's a, it's a traditional HTML templates on your server, um, REST API, whatever it is, um, stick to that. Don't create your own GraphQL-based authentication mechanism. If you do, you will regret it, most likely, because at some point you will want to do something like GitHub login or Google, SAML, anything, and suddenly you need to have HTTP redirections and cookies and everything. Um, we do know of a few people who have very specific uses for their endpoints and do both at the GraphQL layer, and it works. It's just probably not what you would want um, unless you have a really good reason to leave it there. And then authorization. So authorization is interesting because it, I, that's actually another, that's one of the ways I found GraphQL to be really nice. Uh, very often, the logic as to whether you can read an object or write an object doesn't really end up living in your model. It lives more in your controllers. And you can very quickly have tons of controllers in your, in your MVC app. And somebody at some point will make a change that completely breaks your authorization model. It will happen. Um, with GraphQL, there's very few places where you, can, where, where you have to care about it, right? You can, you can decide for any single field from, 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 the, from the object you traverse from whether that field should be visible or not. And then when the, when the field returns an object, that object can decide whether it can be viewed or modified or not, right? And so doing things, something like error back is really straightforward. Um, if, you have, if you want to see code, come talk to me at the end. About any of these, by the way, um, I do have a production GraphQL server on my laptop. <laughs> um, Real-time updates keeps coming up. I do not believe that subscriptions are really what you want. At live sounds a lot more like it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not ready to be specified or even really proof of concept implemented yet. That being said, I'm, I'm pretty confident that at some point down the road, we will figure out something great. Uh, GraphQL does not care about the request reply model. If you look at the spec, if you go scan through it, almost none of the, of the behaviors defined care about how many round trips happen, right? Um, it's really easy to extend your query to specify through directives whether you want something to be kept up to date or not, for example. Like, building those features should be on, on top of GraphQL should be really easy. So I do think we have a great feature ahead, it's just not ready yet. So for now, what we're doing at NDG is polling. And works quite well. <laughs> um, okay. 
the last five slides are basically me complaining about where, where GraphQL could be better. I do think it's great. That being said, you're going to hear about the anno annoying parts right away. Um, there's very few, there are very, very few scalar types in GraphQL. So if you want a long that you know will be represented in JSON correctly, that doesn't exist. Um, if you want to put a date somewhere, you're in the same situation as JSON. Figure it out yourself. Um, there is no standard date type. Anybody here has written a GraphQL server for work? Do you have your own date format? You did your own date type, yeah? Anybody, anybody has their own server and did not write their own date type? Okay. Why do we all write the same thing over and over again? I don't understand, but anyway, yeah. There's no way to, 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 to do blobs. Uh, just do base64 encoding is fine, except you sort of have to agree on that and there's no, no introspection or no mechanism to, to agree on anything. Nothing is a kind of an interesting case. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna explain exactly why, like how useful it is, but uh, ask me if you care. The, there's no easy way to say this integer is gonna be positive. There is no easy way to say this integer is going to be between zero and x. There's no way to do arbitrary precision or fractions or any of that. There are no generics. That one I think really hurts today. Uh, in particular, if you look at the relay spec where they introduce the concept of a node and of an edge to be able to do pagination and to be able to do caching in the way they chose to, to do it, uh, they're really suffering from that. So you end up casting all the time because GraphQL has basically the equivalent of casting. It's really, really annoying. There should be a way to say, this is what a paginated list looks like. There's, maybe, there's going to be a cursor. You can ask for n items. You get cursors back. And then you have a bunch of items. And if it's a, a list of users, the items are users. If it's a list of pages, the items are pages. But GraphQL does not have a solution for that. There is no standard, there's no canonical identifier for an object. That makes building things like caching in graphical libraries a big pain. And you will have to configure things unless you happen to do things the way your library wanted you to. So having identity for objects would be great. Uh, most of the GraphQL competitors, like Falcor, do have something on those lines, or on Next, or I guess that's the main two I know. There is no namespacing whatsoever, which is a bit annoying for us because once you have this great traversal language and you can traverse graphs arbitrarily, it'd be great to be able to start stitching them together, right? Um, I have a GitHub profile in my account. Why can't I just go query information from GitHub? Like, see, see my repos by talking to a GraphQL server that's not GitHub's. Why can't I just start connecting all of those things together? One of the big problems there is that there is no namespacing. I'm going to skip over some of those. That's a bit boring, I guess. Um, <laughs> there are, OK, so GraphQL, I, I'm 90% I'm sure, was built for querying. And then at some point, somebody said, we should be able to make changes as well. And somehow, we're going to find a way to be able to specify how to make changes. They're a pain. Mutations are essentially broken the way Relay would want you to use them. So, I mean, a very simple example is all of your mutations have to have a name and like exist on like one mutation type. So, imagine if Facebook had that problem, right? Like every single operation any user can ever do on the Facebook website would have to be a field on like one object. Um, you don't, strictly speaking, have to follow that. But then you end up having to build a way to order things correctly yourself. The way the spec specifies things is all of the fields from the root objects at the top level are ex executed ser serially. There's no clean mechanism in most libraries to do that uh, deeper down the nesting. And then I'm talking about maintenance issues that you probably won't run into unless you start having like a pretty big server. Um, right, so that's basically, very quickly, if we, if we, about half of the problems I just described kind of show up here. This is something I would want to be able to run, right? I would want to be able to, to, to run one query that uh, grabs 
for this meetup, all of the talks where I'm a speaker and inserts them in my Google Calendar as events and RSVPs yes to the event, right? Like that would be something I would love to be able to write. Everything in red is a problem that, that prevents us from building that today. Um, so there, there's definitely room for improvements and to evolve it towards a better language. But I, I do believe it's a great foundation to iterate on. So we're doing just that. And that was it. Questions? So, okay, so I guess you, you would be looking for something like sort and limit in SQL, right? Well, more like, uh, more like where clause. Okay, oh, yeah, or filtering. Okay, yeah. So, 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 so in SQL, your schema describes the, so the layout of your data, and then the query language is you query it however you want. If you don't have the right indices, it might end up crashing your server, but you can write whichever query you want, right? Uh, GraphQL takes a very different approach, right? The idea is that you expose the functionality you want your clients to have, and so if you want to be able to slice and dice data in a particular way, you have to write, you have to have your server expose that. And the way server libraries work today, there's no easy way to do what you're looking for sort of automatically, right? That being said, there is no reason why you couldn't have a library where the semantics exposed to your server code, let's you do that declaratively, right? Say yes, I want to be able to do uh, have workloads on those fields, and I want to be able to expose those joins to fields, etc. Right? The current model. So that's, that's sort of where that's sort of my problem with uh, section six of the spec being in the spec is right. Section six tells you you have to write resolvers, and that's how graphical servers work. That doesn't have to be true. Like you could, you could typically write graphical servers using much higher level or much more, much more powerful abstractions than resolvers. Nobody has though. But we're working on it. Okay. Is, is there is there uh, any work at the spec to, to, to make that kind of essentially select in right. the in, in the query language? So I, I don't. I, so I. I, I so you, you okay? So having, you, you could you could have a where clause that can take an object, and the object has a bunch of fields. So you can specify a, a, a field name by like, that's an in that, etc. Right? Like you could have all of that stuff be generated for you, right? That doesn't have to be in the GraphQL spec for the GraphQL server to expose the functionality to the client. Uh, but what if you're looking? Okay, what I've got is I'm 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 looking at a a, a, a server that I don't control. One. And what yeah. I want is to get back, okay, I want all the issues, but I only want the ones that are, that, that are not closed. And I can't do it. That has to be exposed by the value. The server, uh, the, no. the guy can only do what the server exposes. What I would like is a spec as part of the GraphQL spec that lets me write that, that, that select such that, such that I can write that specification such that I only get back right after. Uh, maybe maybe I mis misunderstand one thing, but the, so on one hand you want you are you are fetching the uh, so you are telling you I'm asking the GitHub API, which has a GraphQL API by the way, uh, which is really nice, and uh, I want all the issues that are not closed on this project, and I can't do that because the engineers at Peter, when they were on the whiteboard, said, okay, we will expose this piece of the API. This is the capabilities, and you can use it or not. But on the client, you can just tell, hey, I can pass these kind of parameters or stuff. I, the client can ask, but can only ask what is allowed to ask. It's not, like, it's really, client is master. Like, I, 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 I said, hey, give me that. But you cannot do, like too much complex stuff, like you cannot tweak the capabilities, I would say, if it was the point, but 
I guess part of the contract that the schema gives you is if you can query it, if the client is allowed to query it, the server is supposed to have a reasonable implementation for it, right? So for example, um, if you could write arbitrary queries, what if you ask Facebook for all of the comments ever posted that contain stuff? Right? Imagine you could write a workload and you could ask to list comments in the, in the Facebook API. There's, there's no way Facebook would have implemented an efficient way to find all of the comments that contain the word snafu and were posted at like 2 a.m. in the morning, for example. So if GraphQL allowed you to write those things, but then you, could ne you would never know as a, as, a, as a client developer whether those things are safe or not, you, you would lose a pretty big aspect of, of GraphQL that makes it really viable today, which is that client developers can do their thing, like another person can maintain the contracts and everything just works. Okay, what if it's <clears throat> what the spec would say, okay, there's no efficient way for a report, but it can give you the, like, the whole list and send it all to me, and I can filter it. But what happens, what I would like is a way to specify the filter on the server side. Oh, okay. So that it doesn't, you know, like, so it's not, I'm not asking it to send me data that it wouldn't, it wouldn't otherwise do it. I just want to only get the data that I'm interested in sliced both ways. Yeah, right? that should be something you could implement with directives, with custom directives. Um, and if you, there's no, I don't know of any efforts to be the spec for this, but if you're interested to work on that, we can talk I actually, about it. I, I actually have a spec, I'm working on it. Okay, well, okay. Do you have any other questions? Okay, well, okay. <laughs> awesome, next question. <laughs> when you're running a server, what's the best way to handle like nesting, like event nesting, right? So you have after space jam, after kind of like that, how do you, how do you solve that? Um, so optics, we just uh, find the, deeper, the deepest path. And if it's higher than eight, we just reject the query. That's a very simple way to get started, I guess. So like it's custom tooling, I guess? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, probably, it, it's pretty trivial to traverse a GraphQL document in your library of choice and do those sort of things. Um, we are working on a product that does those things better and can do custom analysis and stuff like that, but it's, yeah. <laughs> Not really. Yeah. So this was the perspective from the tooling and on the writing. Like, uh, you say, hey, I have my type hero. I can ask a list of starships that will return list starships. And so starships, I can have starships which can return a list of heroes. Yeah. So it's like both ways. Yeah. So you have like the connection, you define which way the connection should be. And it's pretty But if you have both ways, you have to stop it, right? So if you can do starship after, or after starship, yeah. you have to limit it for yourself. Right? You cannot write an infinite query. You cannot write a query of infinite depth. Not infinite, just you know, more than what you desire. Yeah. I, 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 would give your, I would give every query a, a deadline, and don't accept queries that take more than that deadline, right? What if each query, each resolver has some independent query? How do you know, like, you know, where you are, you know? Each, sorry, each resolver. So each resolver is doing an independent query. Let's say you have the resolver takes care of, like, a part of the query, right? The resolver is, is handling a part of the execution of a given query. Yeah, yeah. What I mean by query is like each resolver is doing its own independent query to the data store, let's say, right? Okay. So you don't really know what level you're in. Right? So if you're saying after a spaceship, and then spaceship says after... You come back to the same query. Uh -huh. You're just asking the same path. Okay. Yeah, you are, but how do you stop that from happening? Like why, 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 why would you want to? You, you don't write that. No, you, you, stop, don't, stop, stop. you don't write it as a client, but how do you stop that as a server? How do you prevent the client from doing that? I mean, why, 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 why do you want to block it? Like, is there like, a particular problem with the client of writing this? Yeah, because you don't want, you know, you know well, let's say seven levels of nesting of reduced square, right? Well, you just described the constraint you want in your system. You can write a validation rule in your GraphQL server library, and the validation happens before execution, and the validation can just check the, check the depth and say no. Um, again, we have something like that for text itself. Uh, yeah, it should be a few lines of Kafka JS if you want to put in Node. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, for pagination, are you guys using the same spec as Relay, or are you going with another spec? We don't really have standard pagination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 
So the question was, uh, I don't know if you hear about how about it here, it's uh, about pagination. We lay it as an opinionated way, and Apollo as an open unopinionated way, which is do whatever you want. And uh, I believe, like, check with your team, and check the APIs that fits your needs. Maybe like, uh, so we had this discussion earlier with the colleague. Uh, we're like, okay, we have a, um, a Mongo, we use some Mongo stuff, and it's easy to have skip, offset, so maybe it's, it's not performant, but to, to prototype something, right? We don't go with cursors, we just keep some stuff. So if you have 10,000 records, yeah, it would be a problem, but uh, if you have 10,000 records, that, that means that your product scale, so that means that you have time to optimize. So yeah, just go. I, I would say to go for the most efficient way that fits the, the needs. Like you're building products for people, so when you hit the problem, just uh, solve it. Yeah, typically optics. So optics, the optics got cut server hasn't needed pagination yet, for example. So I, I'm glad to announce I have no idea how I do it when I need to do it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, can you once again tell us how do people like version on their server GraphQL schema? Like, what if I would like to terminate or remove some of these types, or what if I would like to remove fields? Yeah. So you can mark fields as aggregated. And so your your client's uh, tooling hopefully will tell you, oh, you're using an aggregated field mm -hmm. at one point or another. Uh, with optics, you can confirm that you know the field hasn't been queried for seven months, and then say, "Oh, I just want to remove it now." So there is a specification how to mark the fields. Yeah, there's a yeah in the introspection in the introspection schema there is there is a deprecation flag for. And the second question is, yes. how do people like cache on the backend? Just GraphQL, the backend language doesn't care. <laughs> um, so how, how does this? Well, so. It's used, I mean, there's people using it for SQL databases, with SQL databases, with microservices. Um, you know, things we do it with Druids, with Bitable, it's CD, in Galaxy with, with Mongo. I mean, there's really, you can, you can pretty much uh, wire it to whatever you want. So you basically cash on the data right? And so you can do, oh well, uh, you, yeah, you can, so. I might have a good solution for caching coming up at some point, but <laughs> yeah. no, yeah, um, you, you can cache whatever you want. But, so it, I, I do believe GraphQL is going to give us great opportunities to build a cohesive caching story. But ultimately, I think caching is an application-specific problem, right? Like how your data can be cached for how long, how and when to invalidate it. Like those are problems that are tied to your business model. So if you if you're interested in that and want to discover solutions, so we have awesome community and so awesome dev tools. Uh, there is one to create made by the creator of one of the creator of GraphQL called Data Loader. So I would recommend to just GitHub Data Loader. If there is a walkthrough about the code, something which is awesome, like make your brain grow. So I was like, wow, awesome. And the second thing, so if you want to do JS on the backend, is like check for create GraphQL server. Like, you know, create React App, create GraphQL server, and it generates based on Mongo. It's uh, set it up for you with cu so custom directives, and it's set up um, as a caching with data order, and it's quite interesting to understand how it works. You have also an example on Launchpad, like if you go to uh, Apollo GraphQL slash Launchpad on GitHub, you will see an example of data order, pretty simple, efficient. And if you like Ruby, I, I don't want to say something like that, but is it Shopify? Or who yes. doesn't really? <laughs> so yeah, I believe there are folks that know this stuff. So. so have you cached cross uh, I don't know, but on the Ruby, Ruby server, I don't. I, um, oh, yeah, I uh, know. Uh, yes. no, uh, with data model, you don't cache across queries, you cache per request. It's so yeah, within a request, you don't fetch something twice. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a bunch of Shopify people that can talk about the caching if you find this link. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Uh, is there a standard way to do like aggregated queries? For example, like get the total number of friends Luke Skywalker or some or something like that. Sorry. Like get the total number of something like aggregated queries. Like a count. Yeah, the count. Uh, 
Yeah, several ways. I have a query that gives you a count, first of all. So a query that returns uh, an integer. Uh, run a query that gives you a list. And when you get it, just gives the length of the list. But maybe I don't want a list, I just want the count. Make a query that will yeah. make a count and uh, return, no, return no, an integer. Yeah, there's no, there's no language level aggregation features, right? So, yeah. So yeah, like, the, the language basically explains like this is how you express traversal, and you, you can traverse fields, and you can pass parameters to those fields, etc. And then what you can do in your traversals is entirely based on your schema, and so it's whatever your server exposes is what the client can do. And there's no mechanism on top of that. So, well, there's basic branching that's available. That's the only thing that's part of GraphQL. You can say only access this thing if this variable is true. Basically, that's that's all there is. No aggregation, no filtering, no nothing <coughs> except for what you, you provide as a server. Yeah. Uh, you said you don't recommend doing full, you know, GraphQL. Like, how do you like? You just have standard, you know, REST APIs for that and delegate to GraphQL for everything else. Uh, so wait, well, wait. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So um, slash login, slash log button points, um, and all of my points expect to get a token either through an HTTP header or a cookie. <laughs> So and uh, uh, so you get you, you store your login token somewhere and you want your queries to be aware of the of the current user. So you can uh, actually on the network interface on the client, you can have middlewares. So hey, uh, I grab like the token from the local storage or from the cookie. I send it with my request in the headers. My server gets that. I pass it. Oh yeah, I got a request. I got a token. Can I can I identify the person? Blah blah blah. Or can I check? Is the person allowed to see this thing? And it's a result of you have access to a context, which is per request based, and uh, you can check out here, what's authenticated, have this access, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So pretty yeah, Galaxy uses the Meteor account system, for example, and so things work out of the box, right? So from the GraphQL server, we were able to access the Meteor current user object and pass it down the resolvers. There was zero work required, right? We, have, we already had a login system, and we just had to expose the current user to GraphQL. Um, so you mentioned that mutations are still a bit difficult to work with. Well, what they're, they're a bit quirky, let's say. Okay. Would it ever make sense as a pattern to do all your read-only operations with GraphQL? They keep your write operations in different systems. I don't think they're that bad. They're <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the just a bit weird to deal with. Um, so. It also depends on which clients you have. So, some, for example, I think, I think definitely really classic, maybe still really modern, I'm not sure, uh, require that all of the operations are in the flat list on the root uh, mutation type. If you don't have that constraint from, from clients, the way I would personally do it. Yes, perfect. So, yeah, so I, I would clearly delineate which types are mutation types, from which types are query types. In addition to going through the name, just like foo mutation versus foo, uh, I would only be able, I would only ever have fields that go from a mutation type to a query type, and never the other way around. And I, then I, I, I do personally recommend, if you can afford it, having a hierarchy. So you can have a create user, mes create user met method, or you can have a user ID blah returning a user mutation. So then on that user, you can do a bunch of different things like delete or change email or whatever. Like, yeah. And uh, if you want to dig deeper on that, there is an awesome article on the, on the Apple blog about how to name your mutations using inputs and stuff. And uh, this is quite a hard structure, but it's really inspiring to say, oh, yeah, uh, I'm even fact online, so like, oh, yeah, I was thinking to do this. It's very really interesting using inputs and uh, like, using the football of the idea. <coughs> Yes, um, that's really easy to build with, with some GraphQL libraries. Um, so if you have a few different roles, three different profiles, create different schema objects in, in JavaScript. In Ruby, in GraphQL Ruby, there's, a, there's actually a way you can specify methods that tell you whether a type is visible or not. It's also quite easy to write a validation rule that says you cannot access the introspection schema at all. Technically, you're breaking the spec in practice. If your client doesn't need that stuff, then it works. 
Uh, the one thing that's part of the introspection feature that you want to keep is the field underscore underscore type name that you can add in any selection set. It's used pretty extensively by graphical clients. So, but, but if you want to hide everything else within schemas, that's your right, no problem. You're, you're breaking the spec if you remove it altogether. Um, but uh, having, yeah, having, having different um, partner schemas versus user schemas with different visibility rules is, is a pretty common practice that we've seen a few times. Okay. What's that? What? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, uh, just a sneak peek, so we are dash. Yeah, I was, yeah, this. So graphql.now.sh shares a wall. Uh, so who wants to do GraphQL now? So to be uh, done soon. Please raise your hand. So so okay, who don't want to uh, play, uh, do GraphQL? Let's go. Let's let's talk. We are here to talk. Okay. No problem. We're here to start on it. So yeah, share the wall and um, yeah. So I um, believe uh, other questions or stuff, but share the passion about GraphQL. One thing. Which is, uh, so GraphQL is uh, still evolving and stuff, but the main thing is education. People think, oh, GraphQL, yeah, yeah, SQL version 2? No, no, no. Uh, just like education. Uh, people need to understand how, how is GraphQL. So even if you don't grasp it totally, speak to, speak to, to your developer friends, managers, whatever, whoever. Share the world about it. People need to understand how it is because it eases our pain and uh, make us build uh, better applications. So yeah, this was the world of, of advertising about GraphQL. We can come back to your program or whatever we say in English in the US. Okay. <laughs> Close. Uh, is there a package available for the .NET platform that you can run that control server or like on iOS server? There's a GraphQL.net. There's a GraphQL.net. I know it was barely ready a year ago. I haven't used it since. So maybe. Um, there's a yeah. There there is implementations for pretty much every language by now. Um, I can't speak to the quality of each and every one of them. That's it. Yep. Okay. Okay.